Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Aggie Blum Thompson. Before turning to fiction, Aggie covered real life crime as a newspaper reporter for a number of papers, including the Boston Globe and the Washington Post. Aggie Aggie is a member of Sisters in Crime, Mystery Writers of America, and International Thriller Writers, and serves as the program director for the Montgomery County chapter of the Maryland Writers Association. She lives with her husband and two children in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. We're here to talk about her latest release, Such a Lovely Family. Welcome, Aggie. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. It's so fun. This is such a fun book. This is one of those, oh boy, you just, one little twist after another. So tell us, um, give us a little uh, a little background on Such a Lovely Story. What's it about? So Such a Lovely Family is oh. sort of in the vein of Knives Out in that kind, or Succession, like that rich, dysfunctional family where there's a murder. It's a kind of a whodunit. It takes place, it's not locked room, but it centers around this one um, house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, in a very wealthy suburb, a large house. And it really focuses on this one family and the adult children in the family, maybe a few neighbors and a few other people. But it's got that kind of small community vibe where everybody's a suspect and everybody has a motive. That is such a, and here I call it such a lovely story, which it is such a lovely story, um, but yeah, such a lovely flame, family. Well, so let's just talk about the family because the Calhouns are, yeah, like you said, they're very wealthy. They have three grown children. Um, there's definitely inc- like a lot of sort of sibling dynamics, which I think is interesting between Trey and Nate and um, Ellie Grace, who's the, who's the single girl. Um, are you a, you know, I sort of feel like sometimes when we talk about siblings, there's that whole, like, are you a believer in the sort of order you know, the, the birth yeah, order. I, I'm a classic uh, youngest child, second child, I'd say second child, my brother, the oldest child, the, you know, who was the smarter one, the one who did uh, better in school. And I was sort of the rebel and the the kid who, who, you know, who was always trying to get more attention, who never got to sit in the front seat back in, back in the eighties. I don't know if everybody remembers fighting for who got to sit in the front seat, but oh, I never God. got to sit in the front seat. Um, and yeah, so I do believe in that. And I certainly, my, my husband is one of three. And so I get to observe some of those dynamics. Right. And I'm listening when people talk about their siblings and their sibling issues. I, I find siblings to be really interesting relationships. Right. So tell us about these three. Tell us about Trey and just give us a little background because it really is, I, as you said, it's not locked room, but the murder happens at a part this beautiful party that the Calhouns host every year and then really so it's very clear that somebody at this party um killed them and there are there's the family of course and their suspects there is you know there's there's in-laws there's the neighbor across the street there's some catering people there's a there's a lot of layers to this and a, and actually a lot of people because the you know yeah there's a lot a lot a lot of suspects and good ones because these the the dead person, we won't give any spoilers, did some things that were kind of, you know, not so lovely. So tell us about those siblings, though, because they're kind of at the heat, at the heart of the story. So there are three siblings. The oldest is Trey, then there's Nate, and the youngest is Ellie Grace. And I thought it would be kind of fun to play with the idea of the oldest sibling Um, He's named after his father. He's supposed to be the standard bearer of the family. And he just falls. He's just a failure. He's failure to launch. He's failure at everything he does. He struggles. And his younger brother is a little bit of a golden kid who's smart, athletic, good looking. And I think this causes a lot of of tension between the two brothers because the older brother feels like he's the one that should be you know, everyone's favorite and sort of the the prodigal son, and he's not. And then come bringing up the lead is Ellie Grace, who as a girl feels like she doesn't get 
um, as much favor from her father and she feels left out of her brother's relationship and she feels constantly trying to prove herself. But at the same time, she leans into being a girl when she wants money or she wants special favors. So she does that kind of youngest child thing of leaning on being a baby when it suits her, but at other times she wants to be taken seriously the way her brothers are. Right, right. I mean, it is actually, there's, there's so many dynamics of a family that, you know, that are like other families we know. And so it really, it's so fun to read that there. And, and of course, and it, as in any wonderful suspense novel, everybody has a secret. And, and I mean, everybody, um, right. but including the parents, you know, who, you know, and, and you can imagine this kind of, you know, wealthy enclave where appearances are so so important and the parents are they will do anything uh quite literally to sort of make you know it look like everything is you know picture perfect which of course yeah. it never is it never is. i was really i don't know about you or your listeners and i you know i, I hope i'm not insulting anyone when i say this but uh there's you know, there are Christmas cards you get where you feel like a small fortune was spent on, you know, lighting and, and outfit yeah. and They just feel like professionally done photo shoots for magazines or something. And then you'll get the person who's like a picture of their dog, like running off with, you know, someone's shoe. Um, and so I really wanted to lean into that, that idea of a family that was really invested in their appearances to their neighbors, to their community, to their public. Ellie Grace is an influencer mm -hmm. and for everything for her is about how she appears and really for the right. whole family. And they're willing right. to go to great lengths to um, protect that facade. Yeah. And we all know, I mean, especially from, you know, raising kids in the era of social media, how just toxic that kind of, you know, in that kind of sort of like posturing is for us when we, for, you know, we sort of compare ourselves to what everybody looks like on Instagram, because let's be honest, nobody is real on Instagram and nobody's real on the Christmas card. That was like the joke of my mother would be very unhappy to hear me say this, but that was always like the joke because we're, I'm one of four, we're really yeah. spread out. You know, we're 17 years start to finish. Um, my wow. dad was an OBGYN, really great planning. But it was like, he really, it was like, people would be crying, you know, during the Christmas card, you know, picture yeah. because, you know, my mother would be like, everybody, you know, it was just like this hilarious, like the worst fight of the year was to make the Christmas card look a certain way. Right. So it is, I, you know, I absolutely think that is, a, that's true because that's your one opportunity, right? To show everybody in the world that you're just great, that everything's great, <laughs> which of course, you know, it just, Nothing to so. see here. Right. yeah. Well, it's the same thing with authors, right? Like we put all our, uh, when we make a list, when we get a good review, when something positive happens on Instagram, but you know, and I, and there's a lot yeah. of stuff we would never put on Instagram because it would be a downer. Yes. Wow. Just today, I had to remind myself, don't read your reviews, right? Oh, like, I what know. if you were to like share that, you know? So, so it's it's with every aspect of our life now that we're just always putting our best foot forward. I know. Although I have to say, I love, um, I love sharing that stuff on Instagram because I do think <laughs> there's like it just makes me like, okay, here's the worst one star review I got yeah. you know this week although I do I do believe if you can avoid reading them it's really for your best mental health and for those people who are listening like if you hate 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 a book you know that's okay that's your right you don't necessarily have to share that Just you can tell your up. friends yeah exactly you can tell your friends not to read it but um yeah. you know to post it in the world and for sure don't tag an author on a terrible review yeah, like that is tag. that is so mean that's like kicking someone's dog um so please don't do that but anyway um so tell us you know at, this is my first aggie book so tell us a little bit about sort of you know where do these things come from i mean you're this is your neighborhood right you're in the dc suburb so tell yeah. us about like you know and there is a lot of i mean that's a what a crazy place to live in terms of like people 
pretending to be things that they're not necessarily right. It's wild because a lot of people move here to be close to government, to be close to power. Also every nonprofit, you know, that you can think of the Cancer Association, Wildlife Federation, it's all located here. So you get a lot of do-gooders and a lot of people who want to be involved in that. So it's a real mix of people, a lot of um, diplomats, a lot of international people, and it's very transient. People come and go as well. And that's another aspect of it. But um, I, I think that Um, All my books are really about these perfect kind of neighborhoods and uh, the darkness behind that facade. All three of my books are about that. And it's fun for me because I, I just walk around, drive around, you know, visit friends and I'm constantly inspired. And this book was inspired by the fact that, so every year there's a massive cherry blossom festival in DC pretty famous because Japan gifted Washington, you know, all these cherry trees and um, they're all along the tidal basin, which is down by the Potomac river where the monuments are. And it's so incredible. It's just magical, but there are also these little neighborhoods um, and one of them is Kenwood, not Summerwood like my book, but Kenwood and it's in Chevy Chase. And it's a very upscale neighborhood and they have um, more than a hundred. I don't know how many cherry trees, but many. Yeah. And the neighborhood just becomes like a magical fairyland. I mean, some things are overhyped in this world, but this is not overhyped. It is incredible. And people park and they walk through this neighborhood. This has been, you know, a kind of a secret for a long time, but in the past couple of years, the secret's gotten out and now you just see tourists descending. People have their photo shoots there. People picnic there. People do marriage proposals there. It's wow. a whole insane scene. And um, but it's incredible because it's like a canopy of cherry trees and the blossoms are. Oh, I'm sure it's beautiful. beautiful houses, you know, it's really magical. And I remember yeah. one year I was there with my husband, and he's probably gonna kill me for telling the story, but there was this kind of party or open house happening in one of the big houses and my husband's a very outgoing easygoing guy and he just like walked in (laughs) you're like we belong here sure we do right right and he's like they're like this isn't for the whole neighborhood this is a private party and I just thought oh wouldn't that be great you know like a thriller writer I thought Mm -hmm. wouldn't that be a great setting for a murder a cherry blossom party so um so I had that kind of like in my mind and then at the same time, I saw Knives Out with my family. And I have two teenagers. I have a 14-year-old boy and a 17-year-old daughter. They don't agree on a lot. Let's just right. put it that way. Yeah. But they both love Knives Out. They both loved um, the 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 Agatha Christie remakes, like Murder on the Nile. Yeah. But what if, you know, I could do something in that kind of vein, like more of a whodunit, mm-hmm. a little bit more mystery than a thriller like a lot of suspects well you know the difference between a mystery totally. maybe most people kind of call no, but it's same. good I mean tell us because I think it's something that I, I mean yes but I, explain it because I do think it's something that we sort of we conflate them all the time because people okay. use the words interchangeably but there is a difference yeah so my first book was a true thriller it was one person first person things are happening to her what's happening it's very psychological it's about her psychology her struggles to overcome something from her childhood um very fast paced and uh, this book uh, a mystery is really presenting some kind of puzzle usually a murder but not always early on and then giving the reader the opportunity to solve it along with whoever's trying to solve it in the book. And that's yeah. a more traditional mystery. Some people call it fair play because the reader has the option to figure it out as we go, right? There's nothing at the end that you find out that you go, oh, if I'd known that. Yeah, So I thought right. I'd write something a little bit more like a mystery where the crime happens in the front, you're given a cast of suspects and you're kind of like the game clue, figuring out yeah. who done. And yeah. I thought, in Kenwood, but I won't call it Kenwood, a cherry blossom party. And it is a different vibe from my first two books, which are definitely thrillers and have a lot of dark, dark matter. And this is not a book with dark matter. This was a lighter right. book. And I wanted, I don't know about you, but I want, I needed to write a lighter book, you know? Yeah, yeah. Year for me, it was a hard year. A family member was hospitalized. My mother passed away. I'm sorry, and yeah. I, I can't do dark right now. Like, I can't go there. I need 
yeah. to write a book. And this was sort of what I came up with. Yeah. And it's true. It has that sort of like, I mean, it is every, I mean, everybody is up to something and that is really fun. And I do think like, you know, I know as a reader too, there are times when I'm like, yeah, give me something dark. I can handle it. And other times when I'm like, oh boy, I just want to read something that's really light and and funny. And yeah, because the world can feel really dark sometimes too. So I absolutely get that. Well, that, I mean, it is, a, it's just, it's such a fun book. And the, uh, you know, and the, the way that the family inter, re, you know, re, relates to one another and sort of the traditional, I mean, Tom is a, you know, it's a patriarch, that family. And, um, and Ginny, who is the, the, you know, the mom who does so much work and really has made so many things happen for the family, you know, like so many women, it sort of takes a back seat, of course, because, you know, she's just the woman, right? She's just the the wife. So now how does, how does your background as a, you know, as a crime reporter, how does that sort of feed into this? Did, you know, do you feel like it sort of gives you a different insight into sort of the way crimes really get reported, the way the police work or, you know, or what sort of, how do you look at it differently? Do you think? Um, It's a good question because I don't write police procedural and I don't, Mm -hmm. And there are times when I write things in my books that I know wouldn't happen exactly the way they would in real life. Like my first book, I really was realistic. And my editor at times was like, um, you know, just, you have to, how can I explain this? You have to be willing to lie to your audience, yeah. tell yeah. the truth, if that yeah. makes yep. sense. Yeah. So we have an expectation as readers of what, how things are going to, progress from watching law and order from reading certain books and if you if you don't follow that formula or that cue to that you have to really explain why and that can take people out of a story yes. so you have a choice to make like am i going to really explain to you about subpoenas in the middle of a domestic thriller like no yeah so we're right. just going to make this happen the way you think it should happen yes but uh, yeah so so that's that's something i've had to learn to do to like let yeah. go of because you but, can't um, do that as a journalist that is not no. that is frowned upon right exactly I will say that um some of the I mean it was great I loved being a cops reporter it was really interesting stuff um the, the great thing is you learn to talk to all different kinds of people you learn that you know about what crime looks like you learn about what a, a police report looks like you learn about how investigators investigate and how um the families of victims react when police come or when the press comes, which is actually not, you know, intuitive. You would, you know, a lot of us think the of the press as this very negative um, kind of force. And, and it can be, and I've written that in my books, but my personal experience um, is that most people are very happy when, when the press shows up because most people feel ignored um, yeah, when they're right. families they feel like the world has just moved on and politicians right. don't care or nobody the police don't care and and when someone shows up and says i care i'll write this story most yeah. people are happy so that's and especially thing. yeah especially to give you know i mean especially in cases where something isn't solved and we all know the power of the yeah. media to get people right. to pay attention to things and that it's 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 very powerful and it's very important in solving crimes but that's an example of something that wouldn't really fly in fiction mm-hmm. Right. So we have the trope that the media is invasive and everyone's trying to get away from the media and right. that we recognize immediately. And so, um, yeah, so it's it's it was a it was a really good experience overall. I think being a reporter is a great experience. I don't know if you can be a reporter anymore, but being right. a reporter, is a great experience is great is great um, conditioning for being a novelist. Right. <laughs> How do you mean? Well, you have to write every yes. day and you Fair. can't fall in love with your words you know and you can't yeah. take it personally if they get cut or changed or it's not working out you just have to move on you know yeah. every, every reporter has had their editor say that's yesterday's story move on to today's story right mm-hmm. so it's just this you keep writing you keep going you're constantly improving you're constantly being edited it's not personal don't get emotionally invested um, yeah, I probably should have been a journalist for a while because I, I still have, I still am emotional, but I mean, but yeah, I think it's, 
I mean, yeah, of course, if somebody, I mean, but then I know they're wrong. I mean, like you listen to it and you're like, yeah, that's right. You know, but it, it, do I love it in the beginning? Hell no. I'm like, oh God, I hate that. I hate that you're right. Um, you know, and I'm 16 books in. So I, you know, at some point, right. When do you, you know, I think I probably could have developed some tougher skin earlier on, but I don't read my reviews, Aggie. At yeah. least I don't read my reviews, you know? I mean, occasionally I look at the star number and think, okay, that's fine. But I don't, right. you know. That'll like, make sense. I wrote this book. I, I, my, at my editor saw my first draft and saw something different than mm-hmm. what I was seeing. Um, and said, can you make this one change? And it was just one change, but it was a sweeping change. Yeah. And I had to essentially rewrite the book. You know, you have that weekend where you're like, rah, 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 and like yes. cursing yeah, and like cursing, but then you just do it. Yeah. Right. Because then, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's a trick, right? Because I think it's so easy to defend the way you wrote a book because it's the way you wrote it and it, it's how you Im- imagined it. And it's, it was your vision. But I also think like, you know, the, having an editor who is willing to sort of do the work with you to say, this could be better if you're what, you know, if you do this, you've got, you know, it's a, prof- it's a profession. This isn't, it is an art, but it's, it's not just an art, right? You have to be able to sort of match the business side of it and be like, okay, this is what she's asking or he's asking for and it makes sense. And, you know, it's hard because I think we're, you know, you also stand up for yourself in some ways, right? But I think um, when you have a good develop, you know, editor that you work with, are you with the same editor for three books? Yes, yes. Yeah, and so changes- you know. She was trying to bring me back on brand and I was trying to go a little far afield. Mm-hmm. And she's right. She's right. You know, and I was just being, I have ADHD. I was just being like, well, I want to go do this thing. And she's yeah. like, okay, well, let's just bring it a little bit back over here into your brand. And in the end, she's right. Cause that's what we're yeah. trying to do. Right. I mean, right. you know that you have series, like you have to stick with what you started. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah, yeah it is so true. And, and it's really it good at that. Um, I, I, chafe at that a little bit but you're you know well I mean I chafe at it too and I'm actually it's funny because there is a point at which and I'm there now where I'm writing something that's very that's you know I've always done police procedurals that was always that's been my 16 book thing and I love those books and I've I'm you know but I am doing something a little different now and it is a weird it is a little like jumping off a cliff and hoping that you know enough hands will sort of be like sure we'll try this with you that you know it's it's worth but it's but I think that's a natural, you know, progression too. Like we, we, we need to stay inside sort of parameters, but also stretch the edges. Right. And that's what I think readers, you know, hopefully readers see that, that we're doing something that's a little different, but still that it's, it's our voice and our story. And that if they love that, you know, they'll go, they'll go with us and the yeah, editor's and there to be, you know, at this point, you have enough of a backlist that you've built up that goodwill. Yeah. Like <laughs> I guess we'll find out. That's the good, <laughs> that's the question. We're not, yeah, I hope that's true. We will see. But um, no, but it's super fun. And when you, so when you come up with a story idea, which it sounds like you did when you were, when your husband broke and entered that party, I'm just totally kidding. Tell, I, I didn't break an inch. <laughs> I'm just, just gonna give him a little extra shit since you said he's uh, easygoing and laid back. I love that. Um, But so you, so, you know, you sort of came away from, um, from that with a little bit of a, a sort of seed yeah. for an idea how do these stories yeah. grow for you are you are you a like dig in or are you a sort of like let it you know simmer for a while yeah so I need to like I call it's like a magpie I collect like one little thing and then I collect like another little thing and and then I need to think I think more than I write like I walk and I think I'm constantly thinking because I need to know before I sit down I need to know a lot yeah, I don't like write an outline in the sense that like I need to know how it ends, but I need to have a lot of stuff figured out before I can even go. And I, this is just how I write. Like I don't write these huge drafts that I then edit down, you know, because I just, this just, for me, that would feel like a waste of time. Like I want my words to be going towards the final book. So I don't even sit down to write until like, I feel like it's the story is so intense in me. It has to come out. So that means I spend a lot I'm like thinking. Um, so like this last book, I just turned to my fourth book. And Congratulations. 
Thank you. And I wrote it really fast, like three months, but I had been thinking about it for a solid three months before and sort of like putzing around and screwing around and stuff. So that when like, I realized, oh my God, I'm on deadline finally, I just, I wrote it, but I couldn't have written it without that three months of playing. But you know, like yes, so my- Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was, no, go ahead. No, no. I just want to hear more about the playing because I think that's a, a different way to do it. And I want to hear like, as you're playing, are you like, you know, are you collecting things into a file? Are you writing? Are you vision boarding? How does, how does, the, how does the magpie do her work? I'm curious. So there's this incredible, do you know who Twyla Tharp is, the dancer? Yeah. She has a book. I forget what it's called. It's like on creativity or the creative process. Just, it is so fantastic. Anybody in the creative world should read it. It is okay. so inspiring. And she talks about how she gets ideas for her project and she gets a banker's box or something like that and just starts putting things in. And I'm a little bit like that, like it'll be like a newspaper clipping. It'll be a song. It'll be like a ripping out a picture of, of a cherry blossoms or whatever. And then I have a massive like post-it note board on my wall. Mm -hmm. And I start just writing stuff like on the post-it note and I always rip it up and throw it away, but it's just, I physically have to do something, Yeah, I'm, you know? Yeah. Cause um, you're talking, talking about thinking and I'm like, oh, I would be, like, it makes me nervous to think too much without writing something down. Cause I'm like, I'm going to forget what I thought. It's like when you have an idea in the middle of the night, you don't get up and write it down. At least for me, I wake up in the morning it is gone. It's so gone. Yeah, see, I let those ideas go. I feel like the real ones come back to me. Okay. It's like a love thing, let it go. Because like when I write ideas down, I look at them later on, I'm like, what the hell did I just write? To? What was that? Yeah. Like, yeah. They never make sense to me. So I'm yeah. like, now I know that if it's real, it's going to come back to me. But I'll play, I'll play around with like, I do a three act. I do a, a kind of a loose three act. Like what's happening in the first act? What's happening in the second act? And then what's the big thing in the third act? So I need to know that before I even, frankly, get my characters. Like, mm -hmm. is this a, a murder? Is this about revenge? Is this about, like, what is this about, right? And right. Um, so like my last book I just wrote, I, I was at a, a book party actually at a pool, a book club at a, my pool over the summer for a friend had written a book and we were doing book club. And we started talking about like couples that are really good friends. And where the man and woman of the other couples end up going off together. Oh like yeah. It, right. Right. It happened. It, it does happen for sure. It does happen. Like it just happened with, with those two um, morning show people that got in trouble for having an affair online. Right. Right. right? Yeah. Like their, their spouses got together too. Uh, um, and it also happened with Shania Twain, most famously her yeah. spouse. And her best friend cheated and then she got together with the other spouse and I was like, really they were talking about this at book club and I was thinking I I like I like this mm -hmm. right it's like in the suburbs sometimes you spend a lot of time with one oh, other yeah. family with two other yeah. family yeah and it's very intimate like you might yeah go together you might like you end up sometimes you end up really forming this like little group Mm -hmm. And I thought we had a little group like this. I love know? it. And something, and so that was my my kind of idea in the background. But then I was like, but so what? Right. So right. then I wait for little tiny pieces to, to come, come in. Right. Like something, yeah. right, something, some crime, some death, some right, exactly. And especially, you know, if there's kids involved, right? I mean, that's a whole that ups it a whole, a whole nother level. I it happened um. There's a book called the Sisters Antipodes by a woman named Jane Allison, who is an Australian. Well, she she's not Australian. She's American, but she lived her her parents lived in Australia for a few years. And that's exactly what happened. They they swapped partners. And it's oh, her really? story of the way of that, how that happened. And, it, you know, how it and she had, of course, a sister that was not her sister that we sort of took ended up like growing up with her dad. So there's this weird oh sort of. Right. Yeah. So it's a very interesting sort of. Um, anyway it's a really interesting book and exactly talks exactly what you're talking about so that is and of course we're all fascinated by that because we all have couple friends right we all know you know what that dynamic is like and so 
you know, this is what's so fun about the Calhouns is we all know these, you know, families like this. We all know, we all are see them, you know, from a distance and wonder about their lives. And so you take this sort of universal curiosity and then you yeah. explore it in, in, a, in a fun and thrilling way. I love that. I mean, so much of where I get my inspiration is just listening to people talk about their lives and just observing yeah. people, you know, in my local kind of suburban world. Yeah. And yeah. How do your friends feel about that? They're like, am I in this book? <laughs> do all say that. It's really funny because sometimes people come up to me on the street. My first book has a really terrible, really terrible mean mom who's in charge of the PTA. Um, my first book, the protagonist is framed for murder. Nobody in the neighborhood like supports her. And I've had people come up to me and say, you know, was that me? Was that based on me? <laughs> And it's it's not it's not based right it's like, of course really not based. but yes people often ask me questions That's like so that. That's so funny. I know my mom would take so much offense that like the first in the first three or four books I wrote the mother was always dead, and I was like it's just easier not to deal with the mother because the mother is such a like you know such a powerful it's, force. Yeah, she's method. like why is the mother always dead? And I'm like it's a compliment, mom. It means it's you know you're just yeah you're just yeah, too it's a normal right? mom. I was yeah. hard to sell that. It was really hard to sell it. But anyway, um, it's yeah, fiction. having it. It's, it's fiction, fiction, of course. It's fiction. Yeah, making fiction. it up. Yep. It's mm -hmm. fiction, but it, but it is that, you know, as you know, it does have seeds in reality. And so, of well, course, I'll you, you know, I have a, a friend who, who really thought that one of the characters in my book was, was based on her. And I tried, it's not, it really isn't, but she was convinced and, um, it was a bit honestly there's a little bit of a rough patch there with us like. i'm sure of course of course yeah. i mean not even like yeah if you don't appreciate the personality traits of the character that's one thing but in addition it feels like somebody might be spreading your you know like talking about you i mean talking about like it's one thing to hear right. people gossiping about or hear that people are gossiping about you but then to gossip to hear it it's right. like it's in a book that's going to be available to everybody is a, is a whole different level well so many of the books that we read like if, if they are, get published and if any number of people like them, it's because there's a universality. Yes, of course. So like exactly. in, in my first book, the main character, like I said, that everyone, all the women in the neighborhood turn against her, right? And she feels isolated, like the mom who doesn't fit in. Now she's framed for murder. She feels alone. And so many women came to me in the neighborhood and said, I, I know what she feels like. Yeah, right. of course, because we've all <laughs> felt that even if, you know, we're not framed for murder, we've all felt isolated, like we're on the outs, like we've, we've messed we've it all up. We've for... party and thought, did I bring the wrong thing? Yeah, or wear the wrong thing or wear say the wrong, the wrong thing. thing. I mean, right. It's, right, it's endless. And I think right. women are, I mean, I think we're so much harder on ourselves and each other than, I um, than I think men are. So I, and that, those are organizations. Like, like you said, this universality so people, you know, they might think they see themselves, but a lot of other people think they see themselves too. Of like, exactly. Right. Yeah, I know. It's your poor friend. Yeah. You're like, no, I swear. <laughs> but it is. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. And um, and now do your kids read your books too young still? My oldest does. Yes, she does. Yeah. And her friends do it. too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's like so fun. Padra of like teenagers and college age students from my friends and their kids who read the books and they're some of my biggest supporters so oh that's so fun isn't that yeah, so great I love that I always yeah. told my daughter that she had to be 30 but it turned out that she didn't wait quite that long she <laughs> she got into them about um 16 or 17 but I for a while that my books are dark they're very yeah. dark so I was like I don't know that I want you to read you know them yeah. too too soon so but I love because that I didn't ask her to do it so she just did it on her own you know. Yeah, exactly. She just found one of your books lying around the house. I'm sure that's awesome. Right. Do you do you have a title, a working title for the new book, or it's so hard to know? Yes. The working title is "You Deserve to Know." Oh, I love that title. That's so fun. Well, okay. Yeah. So tell us um, where we can find you online, um, and um, you know, check. You yeah. Know, you'll, so you can pick. You, we can go check out your perfect pictures and think your life is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I have a website, aggiebloomthompson.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I am responsive. Come say hi. I always like to know what people are reading. You know, I'm, 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 I wouldn't say like I'm all over social media all the time, but I am responsive. 
So I, I do my best. I'm a little bit of a, a Luddite sometimes. I, I do turn things off. And Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, you know, that's all of us. That's our generation, right? When yes. we were around in the 80s, we, we know. We the same year, girl. We were born the same year. Oh, we were? Okay, we don't need to tell anybody. Oh, our, I love it. I was like, we don't need to tell anybody. Or we do. Here we are. 1980. <laughs> Um, it was a fabulous year, 1970. It's a great vintage. It was, and I'll, I'll be, you know, around DC doing events. So I have an events page on yes. my, my website. So come say hi. So fun. Oh, gosh. Everybody go check out. Um, so, uh, not such a lovely story. It, such a good story, but it's such a lovely family. And I have to say, I love this cover. I wore, you can't really see, but I'm wearing kind of pink because I, I like to sometimes try to match I the covers. That. Excellent. Yeah, and yeah. it's beautiful. They did such a good job with this. So gorgeous. Exactly. Such a fun, such a fun read. Such a at the end, you are like, holy criminy. Um, and I love all, you know, I'm not even we'd even delve into sort of the relationships that the different siblings are in. Um, so those are super, super fun too. So go check it just, out. Just sold the movie right. So <gasps> that is so exciting. I can totally see this as a movie. Congratulations. Thank okay, you. this such a lovely family, Aggie Blum Thompson. Thank you so much for joining Thank you today. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. So fun. Everyone, this is Killer Women, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.